And um, we will be posting the recordings as well as the presentations to the OCM web website next week and we'll let everybody know when that's up. Um, if you can please keep your mics muted and your cameras off unless you are talking, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions as we're going throughout, um, Julian, um, I know you'll be able to monitor and your team will be able to monitor some of the questions as well. We'll go through, um, but we'll, I think the, the bane of the discussion will happen um, at the end because uh, for this presentation, there's everything sort of builds on itself. So it'd be good for you for if we can sort of hold off and watch everything. And that, I think that will give a much more holistic view of what um, the presenters are trying to, the message they're trying to purvey today. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Julian and team. Uh, and thanks everyone. Julian. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna share my screen here, but before I do, I'm just gonna inter introduce all of the people who created this presentation. If you were at the uh, keynote speaker, you know, there was a mention of standing on the shoulders of giants. And even though I'm presenting, I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. So uh, Anahita, can you say hi? Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be with you and sharing our experience. And I'm Julian Jarash. I'm a professor and also the college math coordinator at Fanshawe College. Uh, is Chris here? Chris? I think that he's in a class now. Yeah, I think he has a class right now. So Stephanie, do you want to say hi? Hello. It's me, everybody. <laughs> and Sandra. Hello, everybody. Nice to see your pictures again. <laughs> I'm glad to be here with you yeah, and share what we, uh, our experience was. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen on this presentation and I'll eventually uh, provide OCMA with a PDF of this presentation. Of course, we're being recorded, so you'll be able to get this thing in a lot of different ways. So, all right, you should be seeing the presentation now. And we're calling this pictures in an exhibition. That's a little nod to Modest Mazursky's um, classical music piece. And really what um, this is about is um, unproctored online assessments, okay? So I'm gonna take a quick pause here and kind of do a pre-assessment. So I'm gonna stop sharing here just momentarily. Maria, could you put up the uh, survey that we were working on? Maria? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. So the survey is asking, are unproctored online assessments reliable indicators of students meeting mathematics course learning outcomes? And you just got a yes, no, or maybe. And I guess that kind of is um, kind of up to you, <laughs> you know, what your overall kind of feeling is, I suppose. So I'm seeing about 20 responses. I think we could probably end the poll there if that's okay, Maria, if you want to publish it. And then just leave it up there for a second while I take a screen capture. And I'm going to put that screen capture right into our presentation. Would you like me to remove it now, Julian? Yeah, you can remove it now, thanks. All right, so let me just share it again. So um, what the pre-assessment is showing just right off the bat, um, it looks like uh, 
it's a uh, overwhelming majority of maybe. And that's probably a reasonable answer, I would say. Um, yeah, and you know, Natalia and then again are even in pro in class proctored assessments, but you know, we'll kind of go over that a little bit you know, since that's pretty much what all of our programs are based on right now are in proct in class proctored assessments um, and how we operate as colleges. So, you know, what happened in fall of 2020, um, the professors who were involved in this study, we had the rare opportunity of having both online assessments and in-person evaluations. As a matter of fact, our leadership went to bat for us, and for a lot of reasons, um, allowed us one in-person evaluation for mathematics in fall of 2020. Um, like I said, it's for a lot of reasons. The reason to kind of put it over the top is that um, students were pretty stressed out about doing online math uh, evaluations. And we wanted, to, and our leadership wanted to kind of reduce that stress. And that was the reason to kind of put it over the top, at least from our leadership perspective. And so what we're gonna show are some visual depictions of um, what we saw when we actually compared our online assessments that were for the most part, for lack of a better word, unproctored, although some of them were a little more proctored than others, um, and our proctored. Uh, in-person assessments, uh, and then we'll kind of go over the methodology of what we did here. So first thing that we're going to take a look here at Professor Gray, and um, with Professor Gray, Professor Gray had one math course in the fall of 2020, okay, and um, it was a level one math course in an, entire, in an Ontario college diploma program. And Professor Gray had all sorts of online assessments, and these online assessments could really be anything. And you know, if you saw some of the um, presentations that, for example, Taras did or Fusina did, you know, it could be messy things, it could be um, you know group work type things, all the different uh, ways of assessing, ways of knowing, those kinds of things. But then they also had tests um, and pretty much the online assessments and even the online tests were unproctored and online. And we went unproctored because we saw um, some major limitations in the um, technology proctoring tools that we had, right? So that's really where we made that, that decision uh, based on how many students we had and a lot of other factors. And the in-person test, Professor Gray only had one per course. It was proctored, it was two hours long, it was face-to-face, -face, and it had a must-pass condition where students had to score 50% or higher on that test to pass the course. Um, so uh, it was delivered in week eight and it was worth 30% of the final grade. So those were the details of the professor's um, in-person test. Now I'm having a little bit of trouble here with Zoom. Uh, I'm gonna show some of the results here first and then I'm gonna see in Zoom what I can do here because I'm losing, there they are, okay. So now I have the annotation tool. So this is what we saw. And you know, I just kind of want to explain what this graph is about first. Um, and what you're seeing here is we, Professor Gray put all of the students in ascending order of their one in-person test score, okay? And then overlaid on top of that, the average of their online tests. So a vertical line represents a single student and each vertical line would cross two dots, right? An average of their online tests and their in-person test score, right? That's what a vertical line would represent. And, you know, when we looked at this, we we're like, well, well, what are we looking at here? Okay. And, you know, one of the perspectives that we had is, I don't know if you remember the Ontario College, College Math Project or College Student Achievement Project. Um, they define students who are at risk as students who are scoring below a 60%. All right. So if I put a line there at students scoring below at 60%, and we take a look at students who are at risk, so as far as their in-person test goes, these are all the students who are at risk on an in-person type test, right? And what you see for a lot of the students who are at risk in-person, their online assessments 
aren't necessarily showing that they're at risk. Okay, and these were their online tests only. All right, these were their online tests only. And that's one of the things that we saw. And, you know, we know that each professor does something a little bit different. You know, each professor has taught online courses before. We've had years of professional development on how to do this and we're implementing things like, um, yeah, so Norm, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. No, they weren't all the same delivery model, but what we're looking at is for similar trends, right? So all of the courses were delivered online and all of the courses had some in-person evaluations, but we'll see all the differences. And, you know, when we saw this, we we're like, well, you know, okay, this is one professor doing their thing um, based on all of the professional development they had and their best practices and, you know, academic integrity statements and, you know, group work and all those kinds of things, right? Everything that we've amassed over our years of professional development. And what we wanted to see is, you know, are any of these trends kind of similar? over all of the professors who have different delivery models and different delivery techniques and different levels of comfort, of comfort with different assessments, you know, those kinds of things. And if those trends are similar, then, you know, maybe those trends are kind of pointing towards more of a truth, but we don't know, right? I think most of us know with academic research, you end up with more questions than answers, but trends do appear sometimes, all right? So that's kind of what we were looking at. And then we looked at over here, you know, and these are the students who perform very well on their in-person evaluation. Typically online, they kind of performed a little bit lower. And we just want to see if any of these trends kind of transcend all of us, right? So let me just uh, clear those out of there. And then what we looked at was the final grade distributions. All right, so one of the arguments that we hear, oh, you know, our online assessments are working because we're getting normal grade distributions, right? Oh, the face to face line has to be linear norm because it's in order of descending score to ascending score. And you're right, it's almost perfectly linear, but it's not gonna be perfectly linear. Yeah, so norm, it will look like a diagonal line from bottom left to top right, just because it's in order of ascending score. You see that norm? Um, so we took a look at the grade distributions because a lot of the things that we hear is, you know, our online assessments must be working because we're getting normal grade distributions. Well, again, the College of the Student Achievement Project and College Math Project show those grade distributions are typically bimodal, especially for first year math students, right? So we're seeing that bimodal distribution. And we want to see if, you know, when we went to online, because um, here's fall 2018 in blue, and then fall 2019 in red, those were in person, right? Were there any major things that we saw that changed when we went to online? And, you know, if you look at fall 2018 in blue, you see kind of that bimodal shape. And then um, if you see, if you take a look at um, when we went online, the mode is a little bit different, but in general, I don't know, maybe those shapes are similar, right? And, and of course you could do, you know, a best fit towards a normal distribution or something like that if you wanted a quantitative analysis of that, but this is just a graphical analysis, all right? So that's what we saw with Professor Gray. And one, one of the biggest, uh, right, I don't know if our goal is a normal distribution, but that's one of the things that we were seeing and hoping that we weren't doing as professors is forcing a normal distribution when we had online assessments, right? Because you don't want to force an unnatural distribution. You just kind of want to let it happen, I would say, right? That's just me. Um, one of the things you have to remember about Professor Gray is Professor Gray delivered that test in week eight of the semester, so fairly early. Okay, and that was one of the biggest difference with Professor Gray. So if you're identifying students at risk based on that in-person test, maybe you have more of a chance to do that as you're looking over here, okay? Then we have Professor Blue, and Professor Blue had three different math courses, okay? And mix of levels, so level one, level five, mix of diploma, bachelor's degree, and postgraduate certificate programs, all right? So a much bigger mix of students. However, the online assessments were like all of those things that you've been professionally developed to be able to, to try to do, you know, and trying all sorts of different things, you know, whether they're open book or closed book or group work or, you know, video things, you know, all those kinds of things. Again, those were the online assessments and they were all unproctored. 
Um, the online assessments were either half the final grade or 40% of the final grade. And then one in-person test per course, and this in-person test per course um, was about half the grade or 60% of the final grade in these courses. All right, so a little bit higher stakes than what Professor Gray was showing. And again, with that must pass condition, but delivered later, week 10 or 11. And with Professor Blue, some of the students even wrote twice and, and Professor Blue kept the highest score of that in-person test, okay? Well, here are the results for Professor Blue. And Professor Blue has a little different take here. Um, what Professor Blue did was put all online assessments into a category, okay? And that's including any online tests and uh, everything else. And then their in-person test is again from you know, low to high along that line, okay? And again, I'm gonna make that drawing of a line at students at risk in person, right at that 60% line, okay? And, I, and what we're starting to see is a similar trend, right? That's kind of transcending a lot of those um, confounding variables maybe, I don't know, when you see a different professor do this. But again, what you're seeing is for the students who are at risk in person, their online scores may or may not show that they're at risk. And then again, you see this little bit of a trend here for students who do very well in person, their online scores tend to be a little bit lower. Okay, that's just the trend. You know, I, I don't know if we can quantify that, but pictorially, that's what we were seeing. And then the grade distribution changes. Now we got three different courses here. So here's course one. Course one actually had fairly normal distribution all the way along, which is interesting. But we do see something else happening here once fall of 2020 came around. We see, you know, some bad news here. Right? We see a little bit of bad news here and a little bit of bad news here in terms of, well, for the students, it's bad news, right? Um, and then in course two, uh, you know, these numbers, if you look at the ends in the course to 18, 23, 14, the numbers are really low. So you see a lot more variation here. Um, you know, um, I don't know if there's a really big change over what was happening in uh, winter of 19 and fall of 2020. Um, but we do see, you know, all of a sudden a lot of students are here in the middle in course two. How meaningful that is, I'm not sure, but there it is. Those are some of the changes in the distributions. And then course three, again, some strange things happening here in course three, but again, the ends are very low if you take a look at the end numbers. And, and But, you know, for the most part, when it was in person, maybe a little bit bimodal. And then when we went online, you know, bimodal in a different way, right? So again, you know, we're just looking at the natural distribution of final grades there for these students. So again, Professor Blue had some similar trends to Professor Gray, all right? And Professor Blue was a professor record for all those terms, for all these different terms, as was Professor Gray for all the different terms of that course. Professor Pink had a level one math course um, and online assessments could be anything. In-person test was a three hour proctor test and now it was delivered even later in week 13. Okay, this one was delivered even later in week 13. And Professor Pink's graphs, well, a lot, of more, a lot more students in Professor Pink's graphs, okay? And I'm gonna draw that, uh, good grades line for at least the in-person test right around here at 60%. And now you're seeing a little bit more, you know, students who are at risk online are also at risk in person, but maybe not to the same degree. And then you're seeing students who are at risk in person, maybe not showing that they're at risk online. And you get a lot more variation here for the students who tend not to be um, at risk in person, right? So, you know, you're, we're asking ourselves, you know, the online assessments, you know, do they have any indication of how a student is gonna do on a high stakes in-person test at the end of the course, right? So we're kind of asking ourselves that. Um, Professor Pink also looked at something else. So this was just the tests over here on the left, but on the right was just all of the students' online coursework. And, you know, with Professor Pink, again, I'm gonna draw that, you know, good grades line for the in-person test right around here. And Professor Pink has a lot more students who show that they are at risk online. Um, 
before they write that last test. But if you look overall, you kind of get a feel for, you know, very few of the students online tests, online activities grades are lower than their in-person tests, right? Very few of a, per, of a student's online activities grade are lower than an in-person test, All right? So that's something that we're seeing here with Professor Pink. Now, here are the changes in the distribution. Professor Pink was the professor of record for all the terms, okay? And fall 2020 is that black bar, and you can see there are some differences between the gray and the blue bars. Um, one of the differences that I want you to pay attention of, you know, if this is a level one math course, you know, a lot of times we see that students who are scoring in that C and D range, we know they're going to be at risk in their subsequent math courses, right? We, they tend to be. You know, we're losing some Ds here, maybe. I don't know. All right, that's just something that maybe we're taking a look at. So the next professor, see if we see any of these trends again. Professor Green, one math course, level one in a diploma program, had three online tests and a whole bunch, and they were all unproctored online. They had equal weightings of 15%. Professor Green didn't include any of those other assessments, like assignments, quizzes, whatever they may be. And only had one in-person test worth a quarter of the grade delivered in week 13. So you see different weightings here. Every professor is doing something a little bit different. And let's take a look at their results. And again, I'm going to draw that at risk line for in person. There it is. And you know, we kind of see that similar trend again that students who are at risk in person tend not to exhibit their they're at risk online. All right. Students who are um, achieving good grades in person tend to achieve good grades online, maybe a little bit lower online. All right, so we're seeing those trends again. Um, changes in distributions, we're seeing some good bimodal distributions here. But if you look at the fall 2018 in-person offering, all right, it's kind of bimodal in that way. And then the fall 20 in-person offering, it's kind of bimodal this way. Okay, so a little bit change in the shape of that district, a little bit of a change in the shape of that distribution. Professor Orange, different weightings, different delivery, different techniques, right? A level one math course, diploma program, and they averaged their online tests in their graphs, didn't include any of the other online assessments, okay? And they had one in-person uh, in test that was three hours long delivered in week 13, and here are the results. And again, I'm going to draw that line at good uh, at the at risk students. And again, we're seeing a very similar trend for a different professor, different course, the students who tend to be at risk in person, um, may or may not be showing that they are at risk online. All right. And you know, that's one of the things that we can do as professors is identify students at risk, especially in level one courses and hopefully point them toward, you know, resources to help them out, right? So, you know, think to yourself if that has an impact on, on you know, how students are gonna perform. And then um, changes in the distribution, you see a really big jump there in um, the online delivery for F grades and um, fall of 20. And you gotta remember, you know, those F grades, it can be partially due to the fact that there was a must pass condition on that on that test that was delivered in week 13. And think about, you know, if we could have identified that those students were going to perform that way in person, a uh, high stakes type exam earlier, you know, what could we have done? I don't know, right? Those are just questions to kind of ask yourself. So, you know, what I really wanted to kind of do, that, that, that's the data that we saw in fall 2020. Um, and what I really wanted to do is just take a break here and kind of, you know, see, are there, is there anything that um, all of you out there are seeing as you, as you kind of looked through these first preliminary findings here? So I kind of wanted to leave it open to a discussion. So I'll just kind of, I'll be quiet for now. <laughs> Um, 
I, I don't know. I, I just uh, started teaching math specifically instead of uh, applied math in, in different courses a couple of years ago. Um, I, my grades don't look like that generally. They're pretty polarized. It, the people that engage with the course generally do really well. And the people that don't engage don't do, do, do poorly. Um, and, and I find it's, it's a bit harder. That's what I'm finding the main challenges on distance uh, delivery is, is getting them to engage because you just don't see them. Mind you, I, I had the same problem in the class where when they stopped allowing me to have grades um, based on attendance, <laughs> attendance fell off sharply. Um, and some of the things I, I, I'm thinking, because um, such a linear distribution, it, it, it's... <laughs> I don't know. It just it just looks artificial to me. I, um, I, I did stop worrying a little. I, I don't like uh, non-proctored testing. I think it's uh, it's too prone to uh, you know to, to people cheating. And and I think if you give people a license to cheat, just generally you get more cheating. Um, I, I start I stopped worrying. I used to be a real stickler on the cheating. And uh, about three semesters ago, four semesters ago. Uh, I caught two students cheating and, and so, you know, wanting to give them the benefit of the doubt, did a really thorough investigation, took me, oh, several days of, of work and, uh, you know, accumulating data and, and proved you know, without any shadow of a doubt that they cheated and, and uh, then the dean uh, just let them skate. So I just uh, took a step back and thought to myself, well, if, if the dean is going to overrule a clear incidents of teaching and, and, and not apply college cheating policy, why should I spend time on it? And, uh, and, and I guess I'm of the opinion now that ultimately it'll catch up to them when they're in, when they're in the workforce and, and, uh, and they don't know what they're doing, which is you know, not gonna be good for the college's reputation, but uh, it is what it is. Um, I, I'm thinking that you, know, you went through a lot of data there pretty quickly, so it's pretty hard to, to, to form an opinion on it. But one thing I've noticed is, is in my online delivery, uh, I'm a lot clearer in, 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 in enunciating what is expected and, and, uh, than I used to be in the classroom because, you know, teaching is a, you know, there's a lot of communication going on. You, what you think you want to say, what you do say, what the student hears and what they make of it, and, and probably a lot more than that. And that's, that's not uh, as... Uh, as cloudy or as 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 uh, as fuzzy in my online delivery because my online delivery is is pretty clear what I'm expecting and uh, because I've I've I'm not I'm not just talking I'm I'm thinking and building and and uh, so maybe there's some of that rolled in there uh, why it's so my grades are so polarized where people really do really well or or they do they just don't participate and do really poorly um, but. I don't think there's any doubt that proctored tests discourage cheating more than unproctored tests. Um, but I don't know if, if, if we can make um, form opinions on whether it's a result of digital delivery that we're having these problems. Uh, because when you start having, some things I used to grade were very subjective and uh, it, it, you know, I've, I've done some reading on it and it's really easy to, to apply uh, personal filters to subjective grading uh, without even doing it consciously. So, so maybe there's some of that going on there, maybe not, uh, but there's, it, it just calls for a lot of thought before you can just comment on, on some distributions on a graph, you know? Right. And I think we're recognizing the same things here, Norm. So Norm, if you take a look at our distributions, they are bimodal, right? There's that bipolar, the, the, you know, they're polarized, right? They're, right. they're bimodal. This, this again, why it's so linear, you're right, it could be somewhat artificial, but it has to be somewhat linear because the students are in ascending order of score. Do you see that? Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, and then... Um, but, but, but I've never, I've, what I'm saying is my score has never been distributed like that where zero to 10 has almost as many as 10 to 20 has almost, like it, it's never, my mind just don't look like that. They look more like this over here on the right. So this isn't this isn't a histogram. This is just a scatter plot, right? It's yeah, but just your blue plot. dots are the online test average, right? And they're just you've got, you've got as many zero to ten as well, you know. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know, right? Well, I, don't we, we don't have a happened. history. I, I, I don't understand how that happens. That's just the natural distribution. That's just yeah, but what's causing it? Don't know. I don't think we yeah, could ever figure out the causality. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as far as remote proctoring goes, remote, proct remote proctoring is a pretty... Sorry, distinct I, I don't hear well. Could you slow it down a bit? Yeah, sure. And remote proctoring is a pretty distinct possibility when you have a few students. But you saw some of our students have pretty big numbers here, and it starts yeah. to get more and more challenging, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, James has had his hand up for quite a while. Yeah, so I was just going to say, Julian, <laughs> and then we've got, and then we've got a question from uh, Alan, and uh, Natalia has a comment. So yeah, James, go ahead. Thank you, um, Julian. I just was kind of curious about those courses that we're doing. Um, the final test, proctored, pass or fail. Um, was that uh, a decision the college made where other courses were also doing that? Meaning as if I'm a stu student in that first year math course, I've been doing everything online and I've been informed now that uh, I have a pass fail single final uh, and I have to come in and do it face to face. Uh, is, was that only for math or was that happening in you know your English, your communications course and other courses? Um, that I don't know. What I do know is other than the professor's data that you see here, there were must pass uh, uh, math courses, all right, or, or there were courses we had a must pass exam and very similar trends, very okay. similar trends, yep. It, and I'm, yeah, and I'm just, um, I guess I'm thinking out loud here towards uh, perhaps that type of environment might have been too anxiety inducing if they hadn't had any sort of in face-to-face uh, -face proctored tests for that whole semester and probably what uh, a year and a half two years they've been doing everything online okay sandra that's important they knew uh they knew beforehand that that was going to happen your call. and also remember we got that in-person test to reduce student anxiety primarily that was the reason that put that that tipped the scales to allow us to have in-person tests mm -hmm. which was you know right so there are two sides to that argument i don't know <laughs> i don't know i don't have a lot of answers here but yeah no I, I, don't, I don't know either i was just curious if that was happening uh outside of math and elsewhere as well that fan shop interesting interesting data thank you Julie. Sure. I'm looking at Alan's question here. Any idea how Actually, many? Actually, sorry, the... Julian. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I did notice Taras put a comment, a uh, question a little bit before Alan. My apologies. Is our goal a normal distribution? I don't know if you had saw, seen that. I, th I did. I think I did answer that. I, oh, I, you did. Okay. Sorry. I don't that. know, but what I have seen is for the most part, kind of what Norm is showing, what we're showing for the most part, and with especially first year math students, even in the college math project way back when in the college student achievement project, you get a bimodal distribution. So I don't know what our goal should be for a distribution, but what we're seeing is a lot of these unproctored online assessments, we were getting normal distributions and we're just like, huh, that was strange. <laughs> so I don't know if to that's- be honest, To be honest, that was more of a provocation than a question. <laughs> yeah. Ask no, you? What sorry you about that. that. <laughs> I, I figured Julian would, would know, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so yeah, Alan, um, I'll just, I'll read it out for anyone. Uh, so any idea how many of the Fs were a result of the must pass in-person test that would not normally have resulted in an F? For example, their overall grade was above 50, but the in-person below 50% resulted in an F. Yeah, that's a good point, Alan. We did not look at that. It did happen occasionally. It did. Um, for the most part, students who scored, you know, below an F in person, they would have scored above an F overall because uh, what you were seeing is their online assessment grades tended to be higher, right? So if you look at, you know, some of the, I'm actually going to go to one of the winter results here, Alan, and show you kind of what happens, what we were seeing. You know, this was in winter. So this is one of our backup slides here. And Professor Orange kind of laid it out in a different way. Here's their test average in person, okay? And, um, then they have their quizzes online, all tend to be higher scores. And then they have their final grade, all tends to be higher scores, right? So it's really hard to say what would have happened were, were things the way they were before. <laughs> you know what I mean, Alan? Another thing we don't know is, you know, if students um, who are going to be at risk in the in person must pass test don't know they're at risk would they have already withdrawn? I don't know. So that's a great question. I, I, 
we don't know the answer to your question, but what we do know is, you know, even overall, if they have above an F, those students were not scoring above an F on their in-person test for the most part. I guess that's the best way I can answer that question. And this is a good way that uh, Professor Orange showed what happened in winter. And in winter, we had two in-person tests, right? In winter, we had two in-person tests. And what we saw in the winter, if we just scroll through some of these, in, in winter, the, um, the disparity between what students were doing online and in-person, even with two in-person tests, became greater, right? The disparity became greater. Very few students scored below um, their in-person scores online. So if you just look a quick look at winter when we had two in-person tests, the disparity becomes greater for students online versus in person. Very strange. <laughs> so uh, I saw Anahita has her hand up. There. Uh, actually, Julian, sorry. I'm okay. just because I'm keeping track of when things are happening. Sure, My sure. apologies. Um, Maxim had a comment in here, and I just wanted to give him the opportunity in case he wanted to elaborate. And then we have Anahita and Colleen. So Maxim said, based on my observations in major math courses at Seneca, we did not observe wholesale cheating in online assessment, statistically speaking. Wholesale is the keyword, and there's his camera. So I had a feeling he'd want to elaborate. Maxim, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so we, I'm uh, the leader currently for uh, so-called Mathematics of uh, Business and Finance course which uh, has uh, 30 uh, sections at least, sometimes uh, up to 40 sections running. So it's a huge course. So by the way, very interesting uh, presentation, Julian. So thank you. Uh, just uh, want to use this chance as well to thank you for the presentation. But uh, yeah, so we did a lot of, uh, actually I did a lot of uh, statistical kind of observations where I asked my faculty to send me some data from their tests. Uh, so we compared online tests with in-person tests, uh, which I also kept track of uh, before COVID uh, you know, times came. So I had uh, a lot of data to compare. And uh, statistically speaking, I didn't uh, find any significant difference between the results uh, of online and uh, in-person tests. So what this means is that um, wholesale cheating does not happen. That's what I, strongly believe based on my data. And wholesale is the key word because maybe, and kind of um, it's natural to think that way that uh, cheating is more possible to happen, of course, but um, only the type of cheating I can suspect when one student asks somebody else to, to do the work, right? Because the way we try to construct the test, and it took some several iterations to, to learn to construct the tests so that a statistical distribution is similar to in-person tests, right? So because, you know, it's very important how the test works, right? Uh, how much time students have for, um, how many attempts they have, what kind of questions, like what, uh, all these th variables determine um, how hard or how easy it is to cheat. And there are different types of cheating, right? Let's say if a student uh, has lots of time, let's say if a student has, you know, uh, half day to answer a couple of questions, that student can now look in the internet, uh, ask questions in forums, uh, or use WhatsApp, everything, right? But if time is very limited, uh, student only can reserve to, uh, to one type of cheating, which is asking somebody else to solve the problem. Right. So you see, we can minimize the types of cheating by constructing uh, problems. So long story short, at Seneca, we kind of managed, I think, to create assessments, calibrate them statistically, such that we do not observe wholesale cheating uh, for online. Because, and it's natural to understand that not every, far from every student has actually access to somebody who will solve problems for them for every assessment, right? It's not that easy actually. Like if you are a student, it's not that easy for you to always have that person who will write the test for you, right? It's much easier to search information uh, in the internet and so on. So um, yeah, and uh, also to add on, you know, this statistical analysis, 
of course, standard deviation plays an important role, right? Like when we compare those bars and everything, so one bar can be so much bigger than another bar, but it may mean nothing if we don't know how, you know, how easy it is for data to jump uh, around, right? So maybe, uh, uh, you know, standard deviation is huge and then these difference in bars mean nothing, you know? So, You're right. Um, so I'm going to just jump in there really quick. You can't really do a standard deviation on letter grades, right? There, you have to use something else. Of course. Um, it's I not mean, statistically still... sound. Now, the other thing that I'll jump in on here really quickly is we did a, a, a review of literature and what it takes to detect cheating statistically. And it takes a lot. Like, you know, you went through it. It takes a lot. And I guess ask ourselves, are our colleges doing that? <laughs> Um, and I don't know that this is a cheating um, phenomenon that we're seeing. I think this is more of a phenomenon of student learning, because what we're saying here is with these unproctored, even unproctored assessments, right? What we're seeing here with just just assessments, and it doesn't, it's not even a high stakes thing, right? The general trend is students have good grades above a 60% for unproctored assessments. And even if you know we wanted them to work together, even if we wanted them to use all sorts of things, and then for a proctored assessment, mm -hmm. there's a difference. So it's a learning issue, maybe more than, than an academic integrity issue. Do you see what I mean? So you're right, detecting cheating is very, very difficult. And it takes a lot. And I don't know if every college is doing what you just did, <laughs> right? Yeah, detecting, uh, of course, in these, you know, uh, the reason I treat my results informal is because to make them formal requires a lot of attention to so much detail that, I mean, it's it's a serious research, right? Like, and they are still informal, our findings, but like, to your point, we don't know what happens, uh, what kind of phenomenons, uh, what, what kind of phenomena are happening when students write online versus in person. Like it was mentioned today, stress levels can be, you know, distraction levels can be different, you know. So um, uh, some people in person can, uh, you know, can be less efficient with pen and paper than, let's say, with uh, technology. So so many factors can actually influence here that we really need to run completely different kind of uh, statistical analysis to figure out those uh, factors. I don't think anybody will do it because it's actually useless research to some degree. Uh, I mean, don't catch me on that word. Like it's it's useful, but it's useless in the sense that it's can, it can be useful only for this particular subject, right? Let's say our findings can be not applicable to another subject because it's completely different universe, right? So uh, there is no such thing as universal kind of uh, outcome of a research that here you go that's what 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 is going on like we will never know because every subject and even even different terms are different you know so yeah i would say 100 percent that you know when you do these studies you just end up with a lot more questions <laughs> you can't i don't like to deal in absolutes and absolute answers i don't think they're there i just don't know that they're there all Jimmy right and Max, thank yeah you. Just for the time, I'm going to um, ask Anahita to share her points and then uh, Colleen, please. Uh, so I found the question from Tara very important. What is our goal? Actually, if we are looking at the graphs, we see consistency in in-person evaluations. And there is more scattering in online assessments and leading to the conclusion that in-person testing would uh, reflect better the actual performance and students' knowledge. So we can recognize there are actually more questions as the answer. For example, how effective are online testing or quiz in reflecting students' performance or how should we measure students' learning? So that's, I think everything is, um, so Maxime said that they have a research too in their uh, university or colleagues too. And I think that's the important part that we are focusing on the students' performance and what they learn. It's not only about that, that we say, okay, proctoring or not proctoring. So it's about the achievement of the students. Is it really the knowledge of the students or not?
So, um, Colleen, you, you've been waiting a while. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for this really interesting um, uh, data that you've shared with us, Julian. I think my comments might be related to some of the, um, the comments that I've seen in the chat, and maybe a little bit related to what Maxim was saying. Now, I don't think you mentioned which courses you looked at when you were sharing this data. Um, I don't, you said maybe it was first year, second year, but I don't know if you said the subject. I don't believe you said that, and maybe that was just for privacy reasons. No, they're all math. <laughs> They're well, all different types of math, though, right? <laughs> there's, oh, you know, technical math. Yes, and that is math, that is for privacy reasons. Yes. Right. Course, right. Yeah. So, so, um, in you know, many of our technical math courses and calculus courses, a lot of the questions that we tend to ask are sort of calculation based, um, or simplifying algebraic expressions or solving equations. Um, and as someone pointed out in the chat. You can put those into an online calculator. You can take a picture on your phone and get a full solution. Um, so I could imagine that when a student is online, uh, it would be really tempting to cheat on questions like that. And it, it's not impossible to design better tests, um, but it is tricky uh, to design different types of questions for those courses. However, when you get into something like business math, um, particularly depending on how you teach it, it, it's mainly word problem based. And if you're having the students use the calculator to solve anyway, the, the calculation part is easy. It's decoding the word problem and figuring out what inputs need to go in. That's the hard part. Um, and so I wonder if if we might see different results when we look at these different types of courses, uh, the courses that are very word problem based versus the courses that are more calculation based. So um, I will say that if you look at the different professors who um, uh, presented here, they were they tended toward um, technical mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of things that we can ask in an in-person exam or even an online thing that uh, don't lend themselves well to calculation and computation. Lots of mm -hmm. figures, lots of analysis, charts and tables. And we use those, right? We, right. we did use those in our, in our online assessments, mm -hmm. of course, because we knew that those yeah. were even harder to than to just calculate, you know, interpret this, what's going on, you know, design, mm -hmm. you know, which is the better design, you know, those kinds of things. And we did ask Absolutely. those in our online assessments. Yeah. So, um, but I, I would tend to agree if it's just straight calculation computation, that's really subject to a lot of lack of academic integrity mm -hmm. um, in an un unproctored environment. Yep. Yes, exactly. Yeah, thank you. I'm just looking, scrolling through the chat. Okay. Yeah, a lot of it is uh, comments. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm seeing the one from Joe. 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 Yes. Uh, of course, the test environment does impact performance, right? Um, yeah, always has, always will. <laughs> and you're right, some people do better on online tests just for that reason. I, I, and I think Joe is getting at that point, and I think maybe Norm made that we can't figure out the causality on this. All that we can f look at is these are the results. And this was a trend that we just saw over and over and over again, right? Sandra's kind of waving her hand there. <laughs> Regarding that, um... In every, in every test, we always ask them, uh, what do they prefer? And they always say, uh, the vast majority says that they wanted to do in-person tests. Um, and we did it with all the courses. They say they were so stressed up on the uploading, the fact that they uh, online, they need one mistake and then the answer is wrong. And then they need it in the word problems because even if it's algebra or calculus, we always give them word problems. And usually those are the ones I always mark by hand. 
right? Um, they were very stressful that to take the picture, to write in the path, to upload. And so they were looking forward to do the test in person. At least, uh, of course, the only fear was the COVID, right? But uh, we were giving them in a gym for 70 students in, in, in two gyms together, right? So they were more than five meters apart. And um, so that was... Uh, Perfect. Nobody was missing the test and the attendance was uh, uh, almost 100%. So the thing is that in every test, I, they always were looking forward to it. Um, they were feeling that they can show more. So they, since day one, they knew. Um, the fact is that they couldn't show, right, what they were showing in, in, uh, in the assessment. That was really put us really struggling because we couldn't detect those students send them to a tutor, send them to nothing, because when they show, they were completely failed, empty tests, almost uh, barely grasping any outcome. And, um, but online, they were fantastic. So I don't understand, right? It is just uh, uh, something that we, the best way I could have ever um, uh, designed the assignments and everything, they didn't show me that that person couldn't perform. So that's what I wanted just to, to say and share. Thanks, Sandra. I'm looking at um, Joe's uh, next comment. You know, as a mature student, as you age, you have all sorts of things going on. And boy, oh boy, is that true? <laughs> and some of the mitigation strategies that you can use. Yeah, I like that. And then Taras, not surprisingly, submits that we should be focusing more uh, less on calculation and more on messy type uh, things that, stu that students would be able to do on the job. Yep. Um, so what I'd like to do, uh, Maria, could we do like the post assessment? Could we just do that uh, that uh, little survey again? So looks like we got about 20 people. I think we can end that survey now. And I'm just gonna take a screenshot of it. Thank you, let's give it a second. All right, I'm going to put that into the presentation. I'm going to make a PDF of this presentation and send it out to all of you right now with, with the, all of your inputs. And I like, you know, Norm's, uh, comment hopefully someone does a more in-depth study and, and what i would encourage you like these graphs did not take us long to make and once you start to have more and more in-person assessments online assessments you can make these too right and they don't take very long and just see what see what you're seeing right it's pictures at an exhibition i don't know what all the answers are here but um uh yeah that's i would certainly encourage people to study this phenomenon more in depth um, so I'm going to chat a PDF of this presentation, if you can just hang on before leaving. Thank you, Julian, and you'll be posting that. We'll also have that posted with the recording um, next week on the site. Uh, so we just have a couple of minutes left. If there's any last minute comments um, or questions. Thank you, Norm. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so Norm's saying hopefully someone does a more in-depth study of this type of data as it is critical to making good decisions on future course creation, but the unseen data that led to that data, how to get that? Interesting thought. Um, so I, yeah, unless we have any last minute discussions, I think we're gonna call it a morning. Um, Julian, thank you. I was going to say we're, Julian's going to post the um, presentations. We'll give I everyone. A I think few it minutes. just it just posted, didn't it? Or, yes, it did. Okay, yeah. it just yeah. posted. Anyone that's interested, you can go ahead and grab it, uh, download it from the chat, 
But again, if you don't have an opportunity or if your device doesn't allow for that, it will be posted um, next week along with the recording. Uh, and I will um, stay, I will keep it open for anyone that is downloading right now for another couple of minutes. So thank you, Julian. Thank you to um, everyone that joined you to the Fanshawe team for all the great work. And we will see you hopefully again in May in person. It'll be nice if you do a follow-up and then we can uh, do a part two to this with the in-class again. I, so, uh, you know, really, I, I, I wish we could all follow up. Right. If we all had some some of this data, like Norma's saying, the unseen data behind the data. I don't know how to get unseen data behind the data. Right. There are like just so many things going on here. Well, Norm's giving you something to think about yeah. now. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. I think we all have something to think about here. Um, but we also have to pay attention if there's a overarching trend. Maybe it's pointing towards something. I don't know. Absolutely. Thanks, folks. Have a good one. Are we hanging out anymore or is that it, Maria? I think we're good, Julian. All right, cool. I'll see you. Okay, take care. Have a great day. I'm going to end it. You too. Thank you.